In this video, we will start building a fabric material beginning with the base unit that makes up any fabric, the thread. Now, this is a small node arrangement that we're going to create. It may not look like much, but it's going to take us through some of the most important actions that you will need to master in Designer. So go grab yourself a cup of coffee and let's jump into it. So this is where we left off. We have a base material node that we use to preview our height in the 3D view. And we are not relying on displacement yet, but only on normal and occlusion data. Right now, we don't really see anything because, well, we haven't created any height map yet. Notice that we still have that annoying warning telling us to create output, so let's just do it now. If you go to your base material node and right click it, you will see that we have a create menu here. Click on output nodes and say no to this. And that's it. Designer automatically created outputs for each channel. Now we don't have to worry about it anymore and we'll go back to this later when it will be time to export our work. So I'm going to give myself a bit more space to work from because as you now know, a graph reads from left to right. So what we are going to create today will be our starting point and what we created in the previous video will actually be our finish. So all of our work will have to fit between these two. But no worries, we can shuffle and rearrange nodes as we go. Now, at this point, you may experience the blank page syndrome. And yes, that wide empty space can be daunting if you don't know where to start. This is what you need to remember. Every complex structure is made out of simple elements. So the key here is to really break down the difficulty in smaller, simpler steps. In the case of a fabric, what you need to ask yourself is, what is the simplest element? What is the building block? And the answer to this is, of course, the thread. All right, so let's hit that space bar and search for first node to build our thread. Now, you may be tempted to type in thread or something to see if anything shows up. But yeah, you see that we don't really have anything except that threshold node. There is actually a good node for what we want to do. And if you search fiber, there is this fibers one node. So let's bring it in to have a closer look. What this node does is that it recreates the look of fibers woven in a yarn with that slanted repetition you see here. So you see in the parameters on the right that this node doesn't have many options apart from this styling slider. We don't need to tile it yet, so let's keep it at one, but it's still worth noting that this node does style seamlessly by default. And this is something we can check by clicking in the 2D view, then pressing spacebar. This hotkey is what will show you how a texture repeats, so you can investigate the seams if needed with that red line. And as you do so, sometimes you might zoom in or zoom out too far and lose the central square. If that happens, no worries, just press F to focus back on the main square. Then press spacebar again to disable the tiled view. Now this fibers one is going to be our starting point. So we may as well connect it to the little setup we built last time, right? Just to see how things look in 3D. Remember, we left click on the output and let go, then simply navigate to where you want to put it. And as you bring it close enough to an input, it will just snap to it like that. Then you click again to dock it there. Now, if we move the cube a little, we start to see some things happening. But it's still very faint, right? So what I'd like to do is crank up the normal a little, just so we can see better what we're doing. So let's click on the normal node to access its properties on the right and boost the intensity to something like, I don't know, five or six, up to you. Now we also need to connect our first node to the ambient occlusion. How do we do that? We could navigate all the way back to the beginning grab the connection again, then travel back to the ambient occlusion node. Uh, but thankfully, there's an easier way of doing it. When we want to reuse a connection that is used somewhere near, we can just control click it and it will create a duplicate of that connection for us. Then plug it again. Again, control click to borrow a connection. We are now previewing on one thread in the 3D view. So we can rotate the cube to inspect it under different angles. Uh, we can move the light around by pressing Ctrl, Shift, and dragging from left to right. So now we need to refine it because obviously it doesn't look great. Here's two things I'd like to do. The first would be to narrow it a bit on the vertical axis to make it smaller and more dense. 
And this is actually something you will find yourself needing all the time in Designer, just moving things around. But the thing is, you can't select elements and move them like you would do on a canvas in Illustrator or Photoshop, for example. Instead, we have a node dedicated to just that. And this is Transform 2D. This node is very handy and you will quickly get familiar with it. So as soon as I select it, see, we have a manipulator that shows up in the 2D view and that lets me rotate, scale, move the input. Now, just a few shortcuts to know here. Um, pressing Shift will keep your scaling uniform, snap the rotation, and keep the translation to one axis. If you hold Ctrl and Shift at the same time, it will scale from the middle. And if you want to get into fancy effects, pressing Alt will let you skew the image. Now, not everything has to be done with these handles. You can also use the sliders in the Properties panel if you want to be more precise. And these two buttons here let you scale up or down with power of two. So it's very quick, but it also retains the tiling. And this is actually quite important. Most of your work in Designer will aim at producing tileable materials, right? And the thing is, the Transform 2D can break the tiling if you're not careful. So if I display the repetition, Remember how by pressing spacebar and start moving and rotating randomly, you see what happens? Even if I try to be careful, seams are bound to appear. If you really want to make sure you're not breaking anything, you can use the safe transform 2D node. It is more limited, but it will also protect your tiling. So in our case, tiling shouldn't be a problem because we're going to remove the borders anyway. So let me start afresh with a new transform 2D. All I want is to squash it down a little. So I'm going to grab this handle. I'm going to hold Ctrl and gently pull it down. And to make it more dense, I might also just divide the whole thing by two. All right, now how can we connect this new result with our main stream that we have here? Now, the good news is that we don't have to take that output and replug everything manually to each node. So instead, I'm going to show you a very simple trick to save you some time. If you press Shift while left-clicking on the main output, it will attach to your cursor the whole bundle of connections. And you can reroute them all by sort of jumping over the output of the new node that you want to include. So again, let me do it one more time. I press Shift while clicking on the output, and then I let go over the new output. Our three view is now updated and we can start deciding what to do next. I think the next thing I should do is find a way to taper it on both ends to create that sort of oval look. The one way of doing it would be to take, well, an oval shape and multiply it on top so that everything outside of the oval would be dark. This is something that is very easy to do in Substance Designer. To do it, we need to bring in two nodes that you will use all the time. We will bring the Blend node, and we will bring the Shape node. Let's have a look at that Blend node first. You see that it has three inputs. The first two one are half yellow, half gray, which means that you can either blend color nodes or grayscale nodes. But keep in mind, you can't blend a color node with a grayscale node. If you do so, you will get that red connection signaling an error. There's also a hierarchy between these two inputs, while the foreground input is the one that will act upon the background. So the background comes first, and the foreground comes on top of it. Let's have a quick look at the parameters. To demonstrate what they do, I will make a simple blend between two colors. So we first have an opacity slider that controls how much the foreground acts upon the background. See? As I decrease the opacity, the blue fades back to red and vice versa. As you may have guessed, we can also control it using the opacity input here. This one is basically a mask input, so it's expecting grayscale information even if you are blending colors. So if I were to use, well, for example, let's take our fibers one here and plug it into the opacity input. What do you think will be the result? Take a moment to think about it. You can even pause the video if you want. As you may have guessed, it's giving us this image, where our opacity input is white, that is around the middle here, the blue foreground takes over, whereas the black areas mask it out and let the red background appear. Hopefully you get the logic of it, 
We'll be repeating these kind of operations a lot during this course, so don't worry if it still feels a bit abstract. And last but not least, the blend node comes with blending modes like multiply, add, subtract, and so on. If you're not familiar with what blending modes are and how they work, you can check out this video on the topic, but again, we will keep things very simple in the beginning, so no need to worry too much about it. All right, let's get back to our thread. Like I said, what we need is to blend this base with some kind of oval shape. So we first plug this into the background input because we want it to be affected by whatever we put on top, right? And now let's take a look at that shape node we added, that second node. At first sight, it looks like an empty white node, but if we look at its properties, we see that it's actually a library of primitives. We can scale them, we can rotate them, tile them, we can also scale them non-uniformly, which is perfect to create an oval. All we have to do now is choose a nice, soft, round shape like, I don't know, a bell, for example. Then we can squash it slightly on the Y, and I would maybe elongate it on the X a little, but huh, it seems that we're stuck at one and we can't go any further. Well, actually, we are not. In Substance Designer, you can override most of the limits by typing in the values you want. So in this case, I'm going to type something slightly above 1, like 1.2 or something. All right. Now, all we have to do is take that shape, that nice oval shape we made, and plug it above our fibers in the blend node, like so. Then we will change the blending mode to multiply. And here we go. You see that we now have these nicely tapered ends just like we want it. Let us reroute our connections once more to preview the result, holding shift and moving it back into place. Okay, now we start to see our oval shape appearing with that nice bulge in the middle. It's still too faint though, so one way we can fix this is by tweaking the grayscale values of our thread. Now, if you're not familiar with what these values mean, let's do a quick recap. So the way a height map works is basically the lighter the value, the higher the area, and the darker the value, the lower the area. So where our map is white, it means the texture will be pushed up, and where it is black, it means it will be pulled down. So to demonstrate this more clearly, I'm going to activate the displacement on our rounded cube here. To do so, I need to activate two things. First, I need to activate the height input in the base material mode. Right, set it to true, and plug our last node directly into it. This one doesn't need any companion node. Nothing changes yet in the 3D view, but if I come over to the material properties and go to material, default, edit, I can access the parameters that control how the material is displayed in the 3D view. I'm just going to scroll down to the height section and push the height scale to, I don't know, 10, maybe 20. All right, now hopefully you see that the whites here are being pulled up and that the gray gradient that we have here in the 2D view is translated to a height slope here in the 3D view. So now that we have this good illustration, let's see how we can change the look of our current displacement by playing with the grayscale values themselves. Designer comes with a lot of tools to do it, histogram, high pass, contrast, but we're gonna start with the most important one, the Levels node. If you have any experience with image editing softwares, this view should feel familiar. Levels basically allow you to remap the values of an input image, bending or reducing the high and low points, as well as shifting the transition between the two. Now, in our case, all we want is to tighten up that shape a little so we have a more rounded profile. So I'm just going to take that low pin at the top here and push it slightly to the right. And I'm going to move the middle pin to the left in order to shift that transition between high and low, like so. See how we change our thread profile? Perfect. And we can easily compare the difference it makes by temporarily muting the levels. If I select it and press Shift and D, the node becomes disabled. See? It's still there, but it's sort of invisible and I can toggle it on and off with that same shortcut to check the result, which is often very useful, especially when you have very subtle effects. All right, looks good to me. 
Now don't worry if the levels notes still seem a little abstract to you, it's one of these notes that just becomes more and more intuitive as you use it, and we will use it a lot in this project. Alright, our base thread starts to look okay, but it still misses a little something in my opinion. If I take a look at my reference, you see that yarn is usually very fibrous, and if you look at it up close, you will see all these tiny fibers tightly spun together. Now we do have this slanted structure, but it's pretty basic. So what we can do is add an extra level of complexity simply by blending a noise on top of this current state. And we need two things for that. First, we need some kind of noise, obviously. So let's open up our quick search by pressing spacebar and see what we have if we type in noise. And we have a lot of options. And with practice, you will get to know most of these by heart. In my case, I already know exactly what kind of noise we need, so I'm gonna scroll down until I reach the directional noises. These are great for everything that has a very directional or layered structure. Uh, think about wood, brushed metals, fabrics, and so on. I'm gonna go with directional scratches and place it right next to our last note. We now need to somehow mix these two together. How can we do it? I suggest you pause the video if you've been following along and try to find the solution by yourself. Done? You probably guessed that we need a blend node for that. So let's just take our base thread, put it in the background of the blend, and put the directional scratches on top. As for the blending mode, let's stick with multiply for this one. Now the effect is way too strong by default, so we can turn it down by decreasing the opacity by half. But it still doesn't look quite right. The noise that we picked is too detailed and small compared to our thread, and it's going in the wrong direction too. The good news is that it's a procedural noise, meaning that it's not a still bitmap, but a dynamic recipe that we can interact with. So let's just click on it to access its properties, and you can see that we have quite a few parameters. Uh, the first one I'd like to change is the scale. Let's take that down to 1. It's better, but still not enough. So what we can do next is reduce the pattern amount to somewhere around 0.2. It would just give us more space to enlarge these long stripes, which we can do using these X and Y sliders here. I'm just going to take a second to fiddle with them, elongating on the Y, thickening on the X until that empty space is mostly filled. The last thing we need to do is adjust the rotation, and I'd like to align it with our thread structure. The thing is, when I want to edit the noise properties, all I see is the noise itself. But Designer actually allows you to edit a node's properties while previewing another node in the 2D view. So just bear with me on this. See, when I double click on a node, I get these two little icons on the top. The sheet icon indicates that this node properties are currently displayed here on the right panel. And the checker icons means that this node output is also displayed in the 2D view. Now, if I were to single click another node, you will see that the properties icon follows wherever I click. But I'm still previewing my directional scratches. This doesn't look like much, but it's actually super handy. So let's put it into practice right now. What I want is to change the noise rotation while previewing the result of the blend in real time. All I need to do for that is to double click the blend to display it in the 2D view, then single click the noise to access its properties. And now I can easily align the scratch's rotation while using the thread structure as a guide. All right, we made it. We made the base thread that will support a whole fabric material. Not bad. This node arrangement may look very simple, but it took us through some of the most common techniques in Designer. Creating shapes, moving, blending, leveling, and adding noise. In the next video, we will see how we can turn this individual thread into a complex woven structure.